Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you for the invitation to discuss this uh, very interesting paper by um, by um, <clears throat> by Glenn and, and Alberto. Uh, I'll start with the usual disclaimer. This is just the opinion of an, a poor author, and is not meant to represent the position or opinions of the JRC, European Commission, its member states, nor the official position of any staff members. Uh, another disclaimer is that, as Glenn said, we are the ones that our unit is the one that provides the, the sausage uh, for the stew. So there's some, some interest here. It's very good. <laughs> it's very good. It's very good. I agree. Uh, I'll, I'll make a quick recap of the, of the paper before I, I, I provide some discussion points. Uh, first of all, the motivation, both of the paper and of the conference, there's this new drive to reduce dependency and foster local production that has seen the the comeback of some things that we were, we thought that we were in the, that were in the past, like uh, trade war or political industry. So apparently, it's no longer the case that the governments shouldn't be choosing winners and losers and just let the market decide. But there's some bigger reasons. There's some greater good to be achieved that m makes industrial industrial policy um, desirable. Uh, I think that I have this graph from the Draghi report, which is basically another version of the graph that you already had in the presentation, in which we have seen this uh, increase in protectionist measures on the, on the latest years. Uh, we have seen an, a number of disruptions that have motivated all these, all these measures, but uh, so far as we were seeing, it has, a, it has had a, a limited impact on globalization. There's been a slowdown, we are not seeing a, a deglobalization yet, and this is a graph from uh, present a uh, paper from the IMF, from the Gita Gopinath, uh, Gopinath uh, team, in which they see that even though there's no a slowdown, there's not a, a deglobalization, we have seen uh, that the blocks are becoming more integrated with each other and less in between blocks and the emergency of the emergence of some, they call it bridge countries that basically blocks don't trade with each other, but they trade through Mexico, Kazakhstan, and, and so on and so forth. So the model has many of the elements of a, of a standard general equilibrium framework for trade, but with the important addition of having this regional component that allows to study the, the interconnection of both the regions and the sectors and the sectors within the regions. Uh, and it's calibrated to this NATS2 2017 uh, IRO. Uh, therefore, it contributes to the literature both in global value chains, in production networks, and of course, on in incentives for policy intervention. And in particular, it uh, talks a lot about the region sector transmission of, of EU policy. Uh, there are three exercises that they produce with this uh, model. Uh, there's basically a trade policy uh, kind of exercise that is basically a 10% increase in, in iceberg costs from imports from outside the EU that is going to create, as we know, some trade diversion and impact on prices and on wages. Uh, then, on the other hand, we would have um, production subsidies that, in this case, consists on a 10% increase to production subsidies in all sectors and in all regions that we can expect a lower marginal cost of production and lower prices. And finally, a government demand increase, so the 10% increase of the government component of demand that is a, a pure demand shock. As he explained, the results are, are calculated as deviations of welfare with respect to the previous situation, the situation without policy, and we find for the tariff policy that there's a consistent negative effect in almost all regions, with the IO linkages exacerbating the effect and actually being the largest contribution to the loss of welfare. In the case of the production subsidies, small but positive effects, although with a very uneven regional distribution, lots of winners, lots of losers, and again with the IO linkages contributing the most to this, um, to this effect. And in the case of the government demand shock, there's the direction, the direction of the effect depends on the active channels that you have in the model, so some of them are more important than others. And of course, the additional demand comes at the cost of higher taxes, and also the dispersion seems to be very asymmetrical. So the, the countries that win, win a lot, the countries that lose, don't lose that much in comparison, proportionally. So, uh, so I was wondering, what's the, what's the policy fitting of, of this paper, of this model? Uh, as Glenn was saying, so far it's just a theoretical exercise to test the model, so it's more of a, an abstract kind of a, of exercise, but it has also some potential lessons on the importance of, of SP lovers and IO connections when you are designing your policy. So even though it's a theoretical exercise, you can still get some insights for policy. Uh, but then it also has a big potential for real life applications, including as you were already uh, expecting, uh, optimal policy. That, that, that would be great. 
Uh, but what about future policy? And, and here I want to talk about a bit about the, how it connects to, to what's been said on the Draghi report. Uh, the Draghi report basically claims that there are three main challenges for Europe, which is to close the innovation gap, balance decarbonization and competitiveness, and reduce dependencies. In a way, as, as I've read, this is a way of saying that the old model of relying on cheap Russian energy, China as an inexhaustible source of uh, exports, and uh, the, the protection of the American umbrella, it's a model that has been left behind, and we need to move together with the challenge of uh, climate change. We need to move into a new model. Uh, the two requisites that uh, the, the report proposes are basically to reinforce public-private investment and improve European governance. Related to the paper, it could be possible, so the, the drag report talks a lot about the green subsidies and R&D support, and this is something that already can be modeled in the model. Uh, basically, it, it would be equivalent to the, the subsidies that you are already providing. Uh, there's also the talk of an increase of defense spending, which in this case, this would be similar to the increases in, gover in government demand that you have in the model. And then with a bit more of imagination, probably we could think on industrial coordination, given that we have linkages in the model between the different regions. Perhaps it would be possible to see these pushes to create a kind of a, a European defense platform, a European aerospace platform, maybe there's something to do with the model and with all this. And so to conclude, I, I just wanted to have um, four, four talking points for, for potential discussion. Uh, first, I, I was wondering if you could model retaliation, uh, not only on tariffs, that has been done to death probably, uh, but also on subsidies. And this is the, the idea of um, a Danny Roderick paper for 2014 that given that there's no, uh, there's no global governance that is going to coordinate to produce green energies, Green, green technologies, maybe a subsidy war could create, could increase the global supply of green technology. So maybe through this subsidy war, we can get to the, the good result of having a lot of green technology. Then the other question is that if we can consider these results as floors, although we were discussing it, and it's more if we can consider it ceilings, because uh, the way that the governments are designing the model, uh, I think that they extract resources from the agents in the least harmful way for welfare. So basically, we have lump sum transfers, debt is costless, you can run deficits, no problem. And I feel that they need a more realistic way of modeling the fiscal side of the governments would reduce welfare. So I'm not saying that you should do, you know, distortionary taxation, because introducing distortionary taxation on a, on a log linear rights model is no one's idea of fun. Um, but maybe that it would be important to consider that this is maybe like a best case scenario in terms of welfare losses. Uh, then I was also wondering if it's possible to model the disruptions because as we saw, the, one of the motivations for all these new interventions in, has been a series of disruptions that have created welfare losses in the economy. So yeah, I think that it would be interesting to see if it's possible to check, to simulate some kind of disruption like a COVID-19 type of, uh, of disruption check the welfare losses, then introduce your policy, see how the economy reorganizes itself to become more self-dependent, and then simulate again a type of COVID-19 disruption to see if there's been, in a way, we are saying that you are losing welfare with some of these interventions, but maybe it's for the greater good of then having less of a welfare loss in case that there's a disruption. So if there's a way of, of measuring this self-reliance in a way. Uh, and then the, the last comment that I had is uh, if it would be possible to check the impact on inequality, inequality in between regions, uh, to show, show some, some, something like a P2080 kind of measure or some correlation with uh, initial GDP per capita, because I think that it could be interesting to see if there's some kind of, of trade-off, because maybe we find that even though the interventions reduce welfare, Maybe they are also reducing the difference between the richer and the poorer regions, that somehow they impact more the richer than the poorest regions. And so in a way, they kind of help cohesion, European cohesion in a way. Or it could be the other case, that, it's, uh, that it actually hurts cohesion, so there's really no saving grace for, for all these programs. So I think that that would be an, an interesting thing. So again, thank you for, for the invitation and for letting me discuss the paper, and, and thank you very much. <laughs>